Hello class, so this is CSE 5250, Section 1, Week 7, Spring 2023. I'm, mainly for this week, I'm going to talk to you about what you're going to be doing for your midterm project. You don't really have a midterm exam to worry about, rather it's a project. One that if you set it up just right, you can just start it up, leave it alone for several hours, and come back to see the results. I'll talk about more about that later, but first let's go through what we have set for the midterm assignment. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is benchmark the performance of the set of Eratosthenes, or more specifically, we're going to see whether making the set of Eratosthenes parallelized will have a benefit a beneficial impact to our execution times. So, this assignment will consist of three parts. First, is the actual code for the sieve of Eratosthenes. So, part one is to submit the code for the sieve of Eratosthenes. Part two is the benchmarks using OpenMP. And the benchmarks consists of 16 different entries. So here, so here's the table with which you're going to be populating with, with um, execution times for different combinations of maximum number and thread counts. One thread is basically a single threaded program. And I have you starting off from there because, well, Ultimately, we're comparing single-threaded performance against uh, multi-threaded performance. And you may think to yourself, you may think to yourself, if we can just add more and more threads, we might pick a, get, a, get, a, get better performance. Or you may think to yourself, that's not how it works, and, what po and at what point does it stop being beneficial? I'll talk a little bit about that as well, because this gets into something called Amdahl's Law. <clears throat> so yeah, this, this is going to be a table consisting of uh, 16 data points, uh, 16 entries, and they're every combination of, and just, there are various combinations of max number and thread count. And you are not limited to this table. This is just the minimum. This is this is the minimum of what of what I expect you to do. If you want to add other entries for say six threads, you're welcome to do that. If, for example, you have an eight core sixteen thread CPU, like I do, you are welcome to go as far as 16 threads. You're also welcome to try this program with even larger um, uh, max search maximums. So here the table goes up to searching for prime numbers up to a million. You don't have to stop there. Really what, what you're limited is how far you're what you're limited is to how much your computer can handle such a large program. So, if you can go up to a billion, then if you can go up to a billion and you know your computer can handle it, then by all means, shoot for a billion. If you were to swap out, if you're able to somehow use like 64 bit integers <laughs> at some point it, the execution times becomes so monstrous that it would take more time than we have for the semester just to get meaningful benchmarks so at some time at some point you're gonna have to stop <laughs> but anyway basically what I'm saying is go as far 
as their computer is able to handle. The 16-entry 16, the 16 table is only just a starting point. If you can only do these 16 entries, that's fine. <laughs> if you can go further than that, then what it means is that you, if you're able to get more meaningful data. So that's part two, the benchmarks. Part three is to answer three, these uh, two questions. You can be as short or as detailed as you like. One, where do you think the sweet spot is for thread count? In other words, at what point does the addition of more threads result in diminishing returns? So if, say you're running your benchmarks and adding, if you start off with one thread and it took like five seconds to run, and then you increase it to two threads, and then you find it out it took two seconds to run, then that would be a significant increase in parallelism. In other words, that is a significant change in execution time, but if you were to go from two threads to four threads and it only decreased by like half a second, that would not be significant. That would not be a significant change, so it's around there that you would declare, oh, this is diminishing returns. It probably it probably isn't worth it to add more threads. And that is one extreme. The other extreme is when you have a program with so little parallel code that no matter how many threads you add, you are never going to change the execution time. And if anything, in practice, it might just make the execution time worse because... Again, I'll get to Umdahl's law, but basically, there, if you recall from operating systems, when you switch out a process on the CPU for another process, that's a context switch, there is some time required to do that context switch. The same is true for when you're context switching threads. So that um, overhead of context switching becomes more significant the more threads you add. So you might find that adding more threads might make the execution time worse. That's one possibility that might happen. Another possibility, that's, yeah, that's one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen is, as I said, when you add threads, and it makes no difference to how many threads you add, because again, diminishing returns. So the sweet spot for thread count at what point does the addition of more threads result in diminishing returns? That's question one. Question two is, where is the sweet spot for workload size? At what point is your, at what point is the maximum value large enough that you can justify making, no, running the sieve in parallel? So imagine you're to run the sieve for an even smaller maximum number. Say, you want to look for prime numbers up to 100. Is it worth... Do you think it would be worthwhile to parallelize that sieve using, like, 8 threads? Probably not. <clears throat> But if you're to run the sieve again on, say, a maximum number of, like, 10 million, then it might be worthwhile to parallelize it then. So yeah, this is the gist of your midterm assignment. You gotta have the multi-threaded sieve of Veritasenes, written in C++ and OpenMP. You gotta have your benchmarks, and finally, you gotta answer these two questions. Where is the sweet spot for a thread count, and where is the sweet spot for workload size? 
4. Where is the point of diminishing returns for Dreadcat? And at what point does it become beneficial to run the sieve in parallel? Or rather, what's the maximum value in which you can start in which you can justify running the sieve in parallel? See? The one thread case is basically your single threaded program. And when you do these benchmarks, what I want you to do is to run a few trials, at least five. That way you can get an average execution time that you can enter into each of these um, That way you can get an average execution time that you can populate into each of these cells. Because it isn't enough to just run it once and say you're good. You gotta run it a few times so you get an so you can get an average because execution times can vary even basically execution times can vary. So you gotta account for that variance by running it a few times and then getting an average execution time. So yeah. That's going to be your assignment. How would we translate this to, well, code? Or in other words, how do we get execution times? Well, I'm going to start off with this sample program that I've shown a few times already. So what we can do is to have two variables that are that's going to be our dread count and our search max. By doing it this, by having variables for those, we can more easily change the Thread count and search max however we want. So I can change it here, and here I have the search max being part of the program in several places, including the part where I print out the execution time. For the thread count, I want this to be, I want this uh, number to be fed into the set number of threads function that is given to us by OpenMP. So, yeah, we need that too. We need that to be a variable just so we can streamline the process of getting execution times. I've shown you how you can get an execution time for this program just by doing this. Using the standard chrono library, we can get the current time before the start of execution before the sieve, and the current time after we've run the sieve. We can take the difference between the start and the stop, and call that our execution time. We can print that out, but if we do, we have to do exec under... Here I have the execution time stored in a variable called exec underscore time, but I have to export it at... I have to um, print it out as exec underscore, underscore time dot count. So, in my case, I have it being printed out as microseconds. If you have a different way of getting execution times, you can do it that way as well. Just be consistent with your units. If you're, so for, so for example, if you are printing these out in milliseconds, which is one one thousandth of a second, make sure your units are the same throughout. The reason why I use microseconds is so I can get more precise execution times. Because if I'm to do something as basic as this, having a search max of 100 and then running it on one, uh, on one thread, I get an execution time of 68 microseconds. That is way less than one millisecond. So this is why I would recommend microseconds if you can. So how would we get these execution times? It's not like you can run this several times and then just get an execution time. Well, one way to one way to do this is to automate the whole process of recording execution times. So an easy way to do that is to just write an extra section of code that will just write your execution times into a file. So here I have C out. Here I'm C outing the execution time for finding prime numbers up to a specific search max. 
I can modify this statement so it also prints out the number of threads. But the gist of what we can do is this. We can include fstream so we can open a file that, for example, I have it as output.txt. I can print this cout statement. I can see out this whole thing into the file like this. And then I can close the file. <clears throat> if we were even more smart about this, we can have the file name be, or rather, we can have, if we're more clever about this, we can have the file name contain both the thread count and the, and the search max. So that way, the only number we have to, the only thing we have to see out is the execution time itself. That is an even more clever way of getting execution times. So if you have a way of running the same, pro if you have a uh, script that can execute the same program over and over again, say, say you wanted to get more accurate ex execution times by running, say you want to run the program some number of times. You can write a batch script that can basically run the program some number of times. And then every time you run the program, it will write the execution time into a file. And, the, and then the batch script will run it again, and you get another execution time. You can, you can do that too. In fact, if you are really clever about it, you can pass in in the batch script parameters for for which the program can run. So we can have arguments here that can be our execution time. No, we can have arguments that will be our thread count and search max, and that will ultimately... Basically what that would do is automate the entirety of your uh, project. Remember, we, all, we just want the execution times. But more to the point, we want execution times on just a single computer. So ideally, I want you to do these benchmarks all on the same computer. That's because if you do this on a different computer, you might get different results because CPUs are different, they have different uh, CPU. CPUs are different, they have different core counts, they might have different clock speeds. Of course, they're gonna have different clock speeds. They might have, but they might also have different um, IPCs meaning that they might, one CPU might execute more instructions per clock cycle than another one. So to eliminate those kinds of, uh, to eliminate those variables, we're basically benchmarking these programs against ourselves. So yeah, so that's why I want you to, ideally you want to do this on just one computer. Okay, so that's gonna be the gist of your project, your midterm project, but I'm also gonna give you a short answer question that's going to be to predict what's gonna happen. Simply put, your short answer question is this. How many, how many CPU cores is best for, what do you think is the optimal number of CPU cores for a CPU. So that's, so that's your short answer question. What is the optimal CPU core count for your CPU? No, wait. No, wait. Yeah. What's the optimal core count for a CPU? I suppose it's a if you think about it, it's actually a trick question. And because, well, I have these things. So my brother and I had the idea of upgrading our computers, and one thing that I wanted to do was to upgrade my computer by, well, this is, well, this is a Ryzen 7, this is an 8-core, 16-thread CPU. 
this is a Ryzen 9. This is the AMD Ryzen 9 5950X. I got this because I wanted to see what would happen if I put this in my computer. But I do have good reason as to why I want to upgrade my computer to such an extent. And it's this. It's partly because I run so many machine learning algorithms on my computer. It's, part, it's also partly because I just run so many things on my computer in general. So, the idea is to jam this thing in my computer to see what happens. And this is a 16 core 32 thread CPU. So, if I ever get around to doing that, task manager will report Task manager will will display 32 separate bar graphs for each logical processor that this thing has. So, but if I'm to, but imagine you were to upgrade your computer in the middle of benchmarks. That might affect your results. So, again, CPUs are different. EPUs that have CPUs may have different clock speeds, different IPCs. They'll have varying architectures. Uh, these two CPUs, this, these two CPUs, actually are on the same architecture. So the, really, the only difference between them is gonna be more on the clock speed and core count. So yeah. So the question is, which might be a trick question, how many CPU cores is optimal? What's the optimal number of CPU cores? So I'm gonna pose that, I'm gonna post that short answer question and I'll have it be due uh, next Friday, something like that. So yeah, you'll have your midterm assignment, you already have your other programming assignment, you're gonna have this short answer question, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Amdahl's law. So this is so there's a good chance y'all have heard of Amdahl's law from say operating systems. Oh, yeah, there's a good chance y'all have heard about Amdahl's law, but this is where it starts to become important. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fire up this presentation and go through what it has to say. So why would you want to make a multi-threaded program in the first place? Well, I actually talked about this. If you have part of your program that's stuck on some lengthy operation, if it's a single-threaded program, you, the, you have, the program is going to have to wait for that one calculation to finish. But if you make it multi-threaded and have different operations delegated to separate uh, different threads, that one thread can be stuck on that one calculation, and the rest of the program, the rest of the functionality of the program can still run even with that one, even if that one thread is still chugging along on that one operation. In other words, Some part of the program will still be running even if other parts of the program are, well, blocked or performing that lengthy operation. So that's one motivation for writing a multi-threaded program. Another one is resource sharing. I'll talk about more I'll talk about more about processes when we get to MPI, but it's easier for threads to re share resources between one another because they're all part of the same process. Or rather, if you have multiple threads that are part of the same program, it's easier to share resources between them than it is to share resources between two separate processes. And it's not that processes are worse at this, it's just that if you're if you have a program that's multi-threaded and meant to run on a single computer, 
that's just one way of... That's just... It's because... It's not that processes are bad, it's, that, it's just that processes are different. To have a program run on a single computer is one thing. To have a program run on multiple computers is a whole nother thing. So, you have to account for that. And why would you run a program on multiple computers? Because in some cases, one computer's resources is literally not enough. Early on, back in the pan, early on in the early days of the pandemic, there was there's this there was this program called Folding at Home that so many people downloaded and ran on their computers that the that the total amount of computing resources was basically enough to make the Folding at Home network the most powerful supercomputer in the world. But that's a little bit more on... That's... But that's more... Uh, but that's gonna be more towards MPI than it is OpenMP. I never talked about context switching, but when you have a process that's executing on a CPU, it's going to take some time to have that process switched out for a different process. Similar with threads, but it turns out threads are easier to context switch than processes. And of course, scalability. You can scale up... You can scale up in one of two ways. You can add... You can add more powerful hardware to your computer, or if that's not enough, you can just add more hardware in the form of adding more computers. At that point, you would have to have the computers connected to one another over a network, and that's when using OpenMP is literally not enough. We'll look at a, we'll look at MPI later on, and that and MPI becomes more important if you have a computer that has to be run on a network of computers. I don't think I ever talked about this yet, but this is concurrency versus parallelism. So, in the early days of computing, you only had one CPU core to go around. So if you had multiple processes to be executed, it's not so much one process gets the CPU and then it finishes and then the next process gets a, gets a turn on the CPU. Rather, it goes like this. If you had three processes and they had to be executed on the CPU, they more or less take turns in a round robin kind of fashion. So, so, one process gets some amount of time on the CPU, and then it goes to the next process, and then, and then that process gets the same amount of time as the first process did, and then the next process gets a turn, and then. It's basically round robin, and it's literally called round robin. It will go through all the processes, one by one. If one process finished, that's that means another process can get to go, be can get to be executed on the CPU earlier. One thread is being executed at a time. Yeah, one CPU round robining between multiple processes. Only one thing is ever being executed at a time, but if you can have it so that the CPU is switching between these processes really fast, it's gonna look like multiple things are being done at once. If you want a more visual analogy of what's going on, consider that in the era of CRT TVs, you had an electron gun that can only light up one pixel at a time. I, if you can call it a pixel. So this electron gun can only fire at one spot at a time, so you need a system of electromagnets that can move the electron gun to different parts of the screen. But you have to do that for however many lines there are on the screen. For however many pixels you have on the screen. And that's just for one frame. In the US at least, 
we have TV screens running at an awkward uh, frame rate of 29.97 frames per second. So that process of lighting up however many pixels there are on the screen, you have to do that 30 times a second. So as an odd piece of trivia, CRT TVs end up having to emit this, as a result, CRT TVs, CRT monitors in general, as a consequence, have to, they end up emitting this 15,000 hertz frequency out of them that only young children can hear because over time, our ability to listen to higher frequencies diminishes with age. So. If you ever, um, if you're young enough to remember hearing a weird high pitch squeal out of a CRT TV, and you don't notice it anymore, that's why. Tom Scott has an interesting video about that. If you, if you're to look it up, it's a sobering reality of getting old and how technology has also advanced. As a tangent. But speaking of technological advancements, these days we have multi-core CPUs. Eight cores? Sixteen cores. So because of that, we can run multiple threads at the same time, or multiple processes at the same time. If we can run more than one thread at a time, and the threads are part of the same program, we basically have parallelism. Now you can run a multi-core, you can run a multi-threaded program on a single core system, but only one, but all of the computation has to be done by a single core, by a single core. So anyway, I don't think I've ever talked about the types of parallelism. So if we divide, what we're looking mainly in the set of Eratosthenes is something called data parallelism. We're dividing a big task, but it's all the same task among multiple threads. So that's basically it. We have a lot. We have one giant task, but it's really the same small task being repeated on an entire list of data points. We just have, what we do is just cut up the list into smaller lists, give each, and and then effectively give each list its own thread on which a thread can execute its code on the list, or each sublist. So data parallelism, parallelism is what we're mainly looking at, when a task can be divided into smaller versions of the same task. Task parallelism is a little bit different, and it's more in line with the example of you have different tasks delegated to different threads, and one thread is stuck on some big calculation while the other threads are still free to do whatever. So it could be, for example, a video game in which you were disconnected from the network suddenly, and that one thread that's stuck is waiting for a reply back from the server. Everything else can chug along fine. The sound engine can still run, the physics engine can still run, yeah. That's task parallelism, where, as I said, different tasks are de delegated to different threads. Data parallelism is same task delegated to different, same task delegated to multiple threads. And as I said, we're mainly looking at uh, data parallelism, because well, the Civil Peritosthenes is an example of a program that we can multi-thread and have it be basically the same code running on different sublists that are ultimately part of the same list of data points. So, finally, we get to Amdahl's law. 
So this is a formula for calculating the potential performance gains from adding additional cores to a program that has non-parallel and parallel sections of code. So, in this, this formula is pretty simple actually. Why is our maximum speedup? S is the proportion of code that cannot be made parallel. Therefore, 1 minus s is the proportion of code that can be made parallel. x is the number of cores that we have. So if you can parallelize So if you can parallelize code, if you can write parallelize code, then the proportion of maybe it helps to draw this out. So to do that, I'm going to have to go back to Excel. I don't, think, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a visual way to represent Amdahl's law, but I'm going to try my best to do this. So let's say that each cell represents 10% of the execution time. So I'm going to combine these cells outside borders and say 50. So let's say a program is split 50-50 between parallel and non-parallel code. If we had... If we had only one thread on which to execute this code, what would happen is this. It means one thread has to do 100 percent it's because if if we only have one thread if we only had one CPU core to go around then this 50% non-parallel and 50% parallel code one 100% of the execution time is going to be represented here so in other words If 50% of the time is taken up by, if 50% of the execution time is taken up by non-parallel code and another 50% is taken up by parallel code, but you only have one to, one CPU core to go around, it means our program's gonna have to do one. This is gonna be our 100% point here. So what would happen if we had 50%? non-parallel code, and I guess we'll do this, this, what if I had, what if I was able to distribute the code among five threads, then what would happen is this. If we were visualizing this as physical blocks where the length of the blocks represented the proportion of time that code the code takes, then if we were to divide this parallel code among five threads, what happens is the parallel the parallel code is divided into blocks that are of size 10 each, and they all stack on top of one another. So as a result, the execution time of this program is now 50% plus 10%. So, as a result, this program now runs in 60% of the time that it took if we only had one thread to go around. But Amdahl's law expresses these kinds of speedups as, well, exactly that, speedups. So we need it to be represented as a multiplier. So, if we want to represent it as a multiplier, that's what this, that's what we're doing here. In fact, if I, 
dude, this. If I compare the two. S is the proportion of non-parallel code. 1 minus S is the parallel code. Dividing by 5 in our example here means 50% plus 10% equals 60. But we have to divide it by 100%. Or if you were to deal with decimal values, this would be 0 0.5. This would be 0 0.5. S would be 0 0.5. 1 minus s would also be 0.5. x, for ex example, of dividing the code among 5 threads, x would be 5. So now we have 0.5 plus 0.5 divided by 5. That is 0.1. So now we have 0.6 in our denominator. What, what we need to do is do... 1 divided by 0.6. So we get a speed up of 1.67. And we can play this game of visualizing uh, we can play this game of visualizing blocks in different ways as well. So I'm gonna zoom out and show off one other example. So, suppose we had a program that was like 25% non-parallel, or 0.25, and the remaining 0.75 is parallel code. This would sum up to 1, or 100%. But if we divide... So this is... So, say we have a program that's 25% non-parallel code, 75% parallel code. But if we have it so that if we have it so that the work of this 75 percent parallel code can be divided perfectly among four cores, then I would have to do a bit of math to do this. We would divide the 75 percent block into four pieces that would look like this. So I'm just going to type it in, out in Excel. So 0.75 divided by 4. And there would be four such blocks that we can stack, that we can visually stack on top of one another because all of this code is being executed at the same time, in parallel. So if we sum this, Instead, we have 0.4375. So, basically what this is visualizing is, if we have a program that's 25% non-parallel code, 75% parallel code, and we're to divide the work among four threads, we divide this block into four equal pieces, stack them up on top of one another, and we can just add... 25% with one-fourth of 75%, and we can say that this parallel program is executing in 43% of, no, 43 or 44% of the time, as it would if we only had one thread. But another way, if we say one 
divided by 0.4375. We can also say that it executes in 2.29. We can say it executes in ideally 2.29 times faster than if we had one thread. So this is a so this is a visual way of representing Amdahl's law using like physical blocks and just stacking them one on top of the other. I don't think you'll I don't think you ever I don't think you ever see this anywhere, but I think I cut it off by mistake. So I'll just copy paste it downwards. So I'll just zoom in so it's easier to see. So. 25% non-parallel code, 75% parallel code. Divide this block into equal pieces depending on how many threads we have. If we have four threads, we divide into four equal pieces. So 0.25 plus 0.1875 equals 0.4375. That means the program is running in 44% of the time as it would with one thread. If we want to represent that as a speed up, we divide 1 by this 0.4375 figure to say that the program is running about nearly 2.3 times faster. So that's the basics of Amdahl's law. On one, if you think about it, on one extreme, we can have 99% parallel code, something like that, and arbitrarily divide it into however many threads we have. So in the limit, we can say that the execution time is going to approach that 1%. On another extreme, we could have very little parallel code and conclude that no, ma how, no matter how many threads we draw at the program, it's still going to execute in the same amount of time. This does have limits because it only it doesn't account for that overhead I was talking about the overhead of context switching threads. So in practice, so in theory, this gives us a good idea of how much faster a program can run, but it doesn't account for, say, that context switching of threads. So what Amdahl's law, what Amdahl's law really does is give us, gives us a theoretical maximum. A theoretical maximum speed up. So yeah, that's on those law. So that's gonna be it for this. Uh, that's gonna be it for this uh, video lecture. I'm going to talk about. We're gonna have a debugging session next week. So if you have, so if you started to write this program and if you started to write the set of Eratosthenes in C plus plus and OpenMP and you're encountering issues, then you can talk to me on Monday about how to debug the program. So that's going to be it. I'm going to have this I'm going to have this uh, midterm assignment posted on Canvas and I'm going to have that short answer question as well. So that's so yeah, as as I said, that's going to be it and I'll see you next week.